Hello everybody, today, is it actually possible to enter the EV debate in a balanced and fair way? Let's try and find out. Now this is one that has been raging for quite some time, and I would like to think that during that time my opinion has been fairly consistent, which is that electric cars are, I think, a vital part of our transport future. However, I don't believe they are the solution to everybody's needs, and for that reason I think we need to consider very, very carefully how we approach this bold and exciting period of developmental change for the entire human race. As this is very much the topic at the moment, there are entire channels out there dedicated to either praising or bashing the EV, and every single week they'll produce multiple videos on the same topic, just slightly repackaged to make it feel like they've made a new video. For me, I don't really want to do business that way, and I like to try and keep an open mind, looking at both sides of the debate and drawing my own conclusion. And if I've nothing new to say about it, then really, there's no need to bore you with another video. So then, what has prompted this? It is the simple fact that after a period of unprecedented growth, I believe the EV market is about to hit some very troubling times, and it's about to encounter the most difficult enemy of them all the truth. So in today's video, some very simple questions. What exactly is the truth anyway? Can we stop the rise of EVs? Should we stop the rise of EVs? What must be done? And does Stacy's mum still have it going on? All this and more in today's episode of JM on Cars. transition to an EV-based car culture is one that feels like it's really snuck up on us. Even as little as sort of three or four years ago, they were a relative rarity. And if you look, say, ten years ago, an EV was just downright weird. And if anybody had one, it was either going to be a Tesla, which was ferociously expensive, a Nissan Leaf, which in its first guise was really fairly useless, or, worst of all, a G-Wiz. And let's be honest here, if you bought a Tesla, it was likely to show off to your friends and maybe claim some sort of weird eco-credentials. If you bought a Nissan Leaf, well, I, I really don't know why you would have bought a first-generation Nissan Leaf. And if you had a G-Wiz, it was because you were a banker that lived in central London and you didn't want to pay the congestion charge. Just about nobody really bought them because they actually wanted to save the planet. More often than not, they were bought because people knew that though the car was expensive to begin with, the running costs were so low that if they did their maths over, say, 10 years, they would easily save quite a bit of money compared with the equivalent combustion engined vehicle. Five years ago, and the technology had already begun to improve quite a bit. The very first EV that I ever drove was a Kia Soul, and that had a range of just over 100 miles. But the second that I drove was the Kia e-Nero EV, and that had a range of more than double. And so, to prove the viability of EVs, I decided to drive one up to Scotland. And I actually had a really good time. Not only was it a very pleasant car to drive, Yes, my journey took an extra hour and a half compared to normal, but I found a nice new town that I'd never been to before, an amazing little Thai restaurant, and I did 500 miles for 8 quid. Now back then, not every manufacturer even had an EV at all in the lineup, with some not really even having a hybrid, and it was really a bit of the Wild West, as some then decided to sort of try and shove an electric motor and battery into an existing car, others then coming out with whole new dedicated EV platforms, and some clearly being a lot further along than others. But over the years, things definitely improved, and today there are nearly 1 million electric cars on the road, compared with under 100,000 four years ago. And in the interest of being fair and balanced, I genuinely believe there are a lot of reasons why we should be positive about the EV. Pun fully intended there. There are loads of scenarios where I think they are genuinely better than a regular combustion-engined car. I've said many times that if you gave me the choice between a small electric car, like for example the e-Nero, the Kia Soul EV, things like the VW e-Up, or say a Fiat 500 Twin Air, I would take the EV every single time, because though I am a big fan of my nice big V12s, I do also appreciate the benefits of an electric motor. 
They're smooth, they're calm, they're quiet, they're refined. They are wonderful things, both in town and on the motorway. Sure, the technology has a lot of shortcomings, but it's also got a lot of upsides too. If you live in a city, they have no local emissions. I've discussed before the overall emission issue, and it's a complicated one, but at the point of usage, an electric car chucks nothing out the back. And this, I think, is significant. Places like London, Birmingham, probably Detroit as well, they have issues with air pollution. And it's something that I think would be wholly irresponsible to simply ignore just because I want to be able to keep driving my V8s. And to be honest, I don't want to drive my V8, V10 or V12 in London anyway, so I don't really consider it to be a massive loss. If you have a regular commute, as many people do, and you know you can always charge your car either at home, work or maybe the station, you'd never have to visit the equivalent of a petrol station in your life. And if you can plan things accordingly, particularly if you've got the benefit of at-home charging and you don't need to put too much juice into a car every day, you can also run these things for a virtual pittance. And for those who like to keep their car a long time, I'm sure that right about now an EV feels like the only genuinely future-proof solution. Because legislation is ever-changing, I'm sure there are quite a few people out there who are genuinely concerned that their nice lovely hybrids they've just had to buy because they now live in a ULEZ zone in maybe three or four years are once again going to be just as demonised as the diesels they've only just got rid of. An EV though, you would hope, is at least going to have some chance of not being taxed for emissions in the near future. And during Covid, EVs were a ray of light to a then struggling car industry. They were the only market segment that continued to see growth throughout 2020, 21 and 22. Although in that time we did face other issues. For example, the fact that though EV ownership was increasing, EV charging point installation was remaining stagnant on account of the many issues being faced at the time. While early adopters of electric cars certainly faced a number of issues, in a lot of ways they also had it really easy because there simply wasn't much competition for the charging points out there and the ones that existed rarely ever wanted you to pay for them. I recall when I was driving that e-Nero five years ago and I had to pay a whole eight pounds to get to Scotland, I was bitter about that fact because I prided myself on exclusively using charging points that were free. And at that point in time, I started to get the whole electric car thing. I thought, you know, actually, this makes some sense. And I even considered swapping my 625 horsepower supercharged E92 M3 V8 track car for a Nissan Leaf because at the time I was trying to build the channel and I figured, you know, if I'm clever about this, I could run a car for virtually nothing. And at that point in time, that would have been a big deal. Now, for reference, I would say that on average, about half of all the charging points I encountered were free. Some of them said that they would be charging in the near future, but it felt like I would say a just majority of them didn't charge you at that point. Those that then did, on average, I would say, cost about 12 pence per kilowatt hour, and the really expensive motorway ecotricity ripoff stations were charging 35 pence per kilowatt hour. And I tried to avoid those like the plague, chiefly because I did my maths and I worked out that at 35 pence per kilowatt hour, charging your electric car was actually going to cost the same as running the Alfa Romeo 147 diesel that I had at the time. And to me, if I could run a diesel for the same as an EV, well, what was the point? Today though, the situation is wildly different. I cannot remember the last time I saw a genuinely free charger, and the last time I plugged a car in at a public point and wasn't billed for it was on account of the fact it was broken and not working properly. Now, your default reasonable price charger is 35 pence a kilowatt hour, and for many fast charging points, 69p is now a fairly common sight. Yes, I know, if you buy a certain car from a certain manufacturer, sometimes you get a discount card, but for me, this just doesn't count for reasons I'll soon get into. To give you some context here though, let's assume an efficiency of an electric car of three miles per kilowatt hour. That's a decent average, particularly at this time of year with the temperatures being a little lower. Now that at 69 pence per kilowatt hour would work out at 23p per mile. At two miles per kilowatt hour, which is what you'll get this time of the year in something like say a Porsche Taycan, that's closer to then 35 pence per kilowatt hour. 
But if you have a particularly efficient car or you're in the summer, you're then talking about, say, 17 pence per mile, because those will do more like four miles per kilowatt hour. A Dacia Sandero will do easily 50 mpg over a long distance, as will a Mazda 3 and a number of other cars. At £1.50 for fuel, which currently is more than you're paying for regular unleaded, that works out at 13p per mile. At 40 mpg, that's 17p per mile, and something sporty that say does about 25 to the gallon, that works out around 27p per mile. So, for fun here, if you were driving an inefficient EV, like an e-tron or Taycan in the winter, and you were paying the full 70 pence per kilowatt hour to charge it, it'd cost you roughly the same to run as my V12 6-litre Aston Martin DB9. <laughs> Now, of course, it's at this point where all of the evangelists will hit the comment section to tell me just how blinkered they are. Because obviously, James, obviously, nobody really pays 69p per kilowatt hour. You get a card with your car that you pay for. It's a subscription, so you get discounted rates, or you can get a scheme from here or here or here, or do this or do this or do this. Or if you charge at home, it's, you know, five pence every second hour, every third Thursday, provided you, you know, worship the sun, you stand in the correct direction. It, it, it's ludicrousness, because to me, what's really important here is consistency. After all, when you go to a regular petrol station, you've got a pretty good idea of what the price is going to be. And the kind of variation I'm talking about here is as extreme as turning up to a petrol station, not really knowing whether fuel is going to be 25p a litre or four quid. It's really that extreme. And this is, frankly, I think, an untenable situation. we got to get Warwick Davis in on this to fix it, because it's not going to work for long. Now, I've done a whole video about this. I called it EV poverty. I think it's a real thing. It's a big issue, and it's one that winds me up a lot, because all the people defending EVs are generally those in fairly luxurious positions, where not only can they afford to buy the car, but also they have a driveway, they can charge at home, and they're able to work within the confines of getting the cheap charging, and that suits their particular scenario. But not everybody is in the same boat. And for me, if government wants everybody to hop into the same boat, they need to make sure that it's going to be accessible to all. It's a big thing, but I've covered this already. This is not news. But while I am here, I want to ask you something that I forgot to mention in that last video, and it dawned on me that this is a really serious and big issue. When is the last time you saw an EV charging point where you can pay cash. Now, I suspect your answer is going to be the same as mine. Never. I cannot recall ever seeing an EV charging point that took cash. In the early days, you needed a special card that was linked to one of the many charging networks, and mercifully, this has now improved. All of them will work with a contactless card, though contactless technology itself is um, a little bit iffy and doesn't always work, so I do worry about relying upon it. Now, the reason I say about paying cash is not for some sort of conspiratorial angle at all. I, I don't really buy into that sort of stuff. But what's important to me is that if you're able to pay cash, that means that you interact with a person. And let's be honest here, there are a lot of people out there who really struggle with, let's call it, pay at pump, because that's what EV charging points generally are. And maybe they struggle with it because their credit card isn't working very well on that particular day, or maybe they're a bit old and doddery and they're not really sure about this newfangled internet thing. Perhaps they're simply a little bit dense, or maybe they're disabled. Most EV charging points are essentially as user-friendly as this fridge. They're just monoliths in a car park, attached really to nothing. And even when they are built in the sort of grid serve style of mimicking an old fashioned forecourt, actually the, the charging bit and the shops inside, they're not connected. The person inside can't help you charge your car. Now, very often there will be an EV expert available at these places, but I got thinking recently, you know, there is a whole scheme in place for disabled drivers to be able to fill up their cars. It's in mobility. It's important, I think, particularly for those who maybe struggle with day-to-day -day stuff. And I thought, well, 
how do you get on with this? How do you charge? So I looked into it a little bit and certain places like GridServe do have a scheme. There is an app you can get on your phone. And what you do is if you want to uh, charge up, you use this app, which GridServe is a part of, and you basically tell them that you're going to go to the EV charging station and you need to charge your car, but for whatever reason, you might need some help. I mean, when you think about it, they're big, heavy cables, you know, you need to sometimes press buttons on screens and stuff like that. Maybe that's just something somebody can't do. All that this app will really do is tell you if somebody is at the place or not, and then in theory, it would summon a person to there. So as far as I can see it, and I could be horrendously, tragically wrong about this, but if you are currently a person of such limited mobility that you need help to charge your electric car, and I can see that could count a number of people, right about now, you're okay provided you want to charge somewhere near Braintree or Norwich during working hours, probably. And this doesn't feel to me like a particularly inclusive future. In my many videos that I make, one of the things I'm really, really big on is motoring being something that should be accessible to as many people as possible. Because to me, simply put, it's freedom. Particularly when I live in the sticks where the bus is a myth that we told the kids to scare them at night, having a car is vital. It's just a rite of passage. You need it. I don't drive because I want to. Well, I, I do drive because I want to, but I enjoy it. And as it happens, if I want to get anything, I need to. Simple as that. So to deny this to people that are society's most vulnerable just because of convenience for the rest of us, well, it's not a future I really want to be a part of. And yes, before you mention it, I do know that there are plenty of petrol pumps out there where the situation is likely going to be exactly the same. However, unattended petrol pumps is more of an exception where for EVs, I would say it is the norm. And that again is another reason I do feel passionately about it. I am confident that this situation will improve over time, but it's another part of this chicken and egg scenario where I think really we have to have the solution in place before we tell people they've got to use it. It's as simple as that. So that's one thing, and in part, I've discussed some of this stuff previously. However, there is another side to this whole EV debate, and it is becoming increasingly obvious and I think needs to be discussed. That is the fact that for whatever reason, EVs appear to be the latest darling of the scaremongering conspiracy brigade. And somehow they have found themselves at the heart of a great number of videos, some of which actually have a degree of truth to them and some of which are just completely and totally bonkers. I think in a lot of ways, EVs are suffering very much from the same thing as supercars do. In other words, if a Ferrari catches fire and nobody was there to put it on Instagram, did it really happen? There are whole websites out there dedicated simply to pictures and videos of Teslas and other EVs catching fire. And this, though sometimes entertaining, is also a little bit worrying and I think very, very concerning because it doesn't ever paint a very balanced or fair picture. I mean, to give you an example, I'm sure you heard of the Luton Airport fire, where recently a multi-storey car park was burned to the ground in a fire that, as far as I can tell, was started by a diesel Range Rover. And yet, that still has become the focus of many of these anti-EV types. And I find this absolutely fascinating because it feels like now we're at the point where EVs don't really even need to do anything actively wrong. People will still find a way to blame them for something entirely else. And um, that's troubling. Now I need to tread really, 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 really carefully with this next bit. Otherwise, I run the risk of myself becoming another one of these scaremongering types, and that is absolutely not what I want to do. Tonight at 11. Doom! But in my quest to remain fair and balanced, I think it's important to say that to entirely ignore what some of these people have to say would be equally as dangerous to listening only to what they have to say. And yes, I'm sure there is an element of view chasing, clickbait titles, just trying to rake the money in because this is the topic of the moment. In these many videos, there is also often an element of truth. And this is important. I think with any debate on any topic, you'll find there are two sides quite opposite to one another. And the truth 
generally lies somewhere in the middle. And so I think if you want to be a reasonable, balanced and considerate human being, it's worthwhile taking a look at both sides of the topic and then drawing your own conclusion. And I don't think that is a particularly outrageous statement. Somewhere between these two extremes, you're going to find the truth. It's a tricky word, that. Truth, isn't it? It's one of those words that's highly emotive and often used by some of these commentators to try and stoke emotion within you, try and make you feel something, usually anger, and that way hopefully you'll side with whatever it is they're saying, no matter how ludicrous and outrageous that it is. My personal favourite example was one Australian commentator who, talking about the Luton Airport video, took an excerpt from one of the people investigating, one of the senior firemen, who said, we believe the fire was started by a diesel Range Rover. And this chap then proceeded to go into a sort of, you know, frothy mouth rant about how the word believe was deliberately chosen to invoke religious connotations. And this man was using the imagery of the Bible, twisting it around to make sure it fit his agenda and that you would fall for his lies. I mean, I don't really think anyone's trying to be deliberately religious when they use the word believe. I, I, I mean, am I wrong here? But that's not how I see it. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you know what, mate, put a reggae record on and chill out. You need it. You're going to hurt yourself if that's how you see everything. You really are. But some of these people do raise very valid and sometimes fairly well-considered points. Now, Black Belt Barrister actually did a very good video on this car park fire and why it was that the car park wasn't liable, despite the fact they didn't have sprinklers there. It's a great video. I highly recommend that you watch it. I'll put the link in the description down below. But the short version is... They weren't legally required to put sprinklers in there, and the fire wasn't started by an absence of sprinklers. Now, I'm sure, like me, you're probably kind of surprised that an airport with a big multi-storey car park didn't have some sort of firefighting appliance on hand that couldn't easily and quickly hop into the car park and, you know, secure the fire, case the thing in foam or something to, you know, stop it from spreading and getting out of hand and as it did destroying a 20 million pound car park along with all of its contents. I don't want that guy's insurance renewal next year, honestly. But they didn't for whatever reason. However, I'm sure a number of you are also ready to tell me that, well, actually, it wouldn't necessarily have mattered because had that fire touched an EV, regardless of what actually started it, by the time one of those is on fire, you aren't putting it out. And though thus far it seems fairly certain it was not an EV that started the fire. There were EVs present in the building. There were, I think, EV charging points in the building, though on a different floor. And I'm very, very glad that, far as I'm aware, all that's happened here is destruction of replaceable property. I know there's a whole mess going on with insurance and everything, but no body was hurt. And that is, to me, the most important thing. However, it raises a lot of questions. And this is where it all begins, because you then go, OK, so what if they did actually have sprinklers in there, but it was an EV that started the fire in the first place, and that's parked next to another EV, parked next to another EV, as we're uh, you know, told is going to be the future in 10 years or so. Well, sprinklers would have done nothing. They wouldn't have been able to put the fire out. The thing would have burned down regardless, so it would have all been academic. And so then you've got to start thinking, well, OK, what are the... Uh, what are the potential implications of this? And yes, I know EV fans will be quick to point out that all of us dinosaurs have been happily driving around for decades with tens of litres of highly flammable liquid right under us. But the fact is, petrol burns. We know how it burns, why it burns, and we also know how to put it out. Are EV fires particularly commonplace? No, they're not. But when they do happen, they happen in a way that is very very different to a traditional petrol or diesel fire. Not that diesel likes to burn very easily, but eventually it will. And let's be fair here, in a perfect world, a jug of diesel, a jug of petrol or a battery will not simply self-combust. I'm sure we all recall the Samsung mobile phone incident from a number of years ago when they just seemed to go off for fun. Well, that happened because of defective design, the same way I'm sure that many petrol cars catch fire. It was something that went wrong. It should never have happened. Annoyingly, when it came to the mobile phone thing, and I seem to recall some laptops as well were going up at that time, the blowback was actually quite significant because just about anybody and everybody then decided they wanted absolutely nothing to do with lithium cells. And I'm talking about ones this big, not this big. 
This frustrated me greatly because at this point in time I was still working in film and all of my stuff was powered by lithium batteries. Nice big chunky ones like so. They were five, six hundred pounds each and they were built ludicrously well. You could play football with the things and they would be fine. But because some of them in a totally different device had gone off, everybody decided that's it. We don't care how good your battery is. We've heard stories about other ones going off. We're not taking the risk anymore. This is how it begins. We have now arrived at the heart of today's video, and it's all about the truth. Because you see, that is a far more flexible concept than it really should be. This is all because, as humans, we are often prone to following more what we believe rather than what is actually true. And I am now hearing an increasing number of horror stories regarding EVs that have real, genuine consequences. On a number of occasions, I have now heard stories from people that have either had or know somebody that has a body shop, and they're currently fearful of having any electric vehicle in. And when this starts happening, people get nervous because you go, oh, crikey blimey, um, actually one of these things could go off on its own. Now, just to bear in mind there, we're talking about crashed cars here, not pristine, ordinary, normal vehicles, cars that have had damage done to them that are not in their correct and fit state. And we know that at present, and this is improving, I, I accept that, but old EVs are still on the road. So while they're still on the road, we need to pay attention to the way they behave. We know from multiple videos and things, widely available information, these cars cannot just catch fire on their own, but also catch fire again after they have been put out. And so people are being told, well, if you have one of these EVs in, then, you know, you can't have it in for that long, or maybe you've got to keep it outside and it's got to be far away, or you've got to upgrade your fire safety kit and it's going to cost you far more money than it's going to be worth. I'm also hearing from body repair shops that EVs are coming in with damage that to anything else would be fairly minor, but because there's not even actual damage, but the potential of damage to the battery pack, the, the whole car is being written off. People are being afraid of even touching the thing because they're terrified they're going to be electrocuted or something like that. And I guarantee you, as soon as a Tesla catches fire on its own in a body shop and somebody gets hurt, well, just about no body shop is actually going to want to touch them full stop, which means that they're very quickly going to become almost uninsurable, not because they can't be fixed, but because nobody wants to fix them, or the only people that want to are Tesla, and then they're going to have a list so long cars are going to be written off simply because the wait period to get something fixed is just too long, and to keep somebody in a hire car is going to write a car off on its own. This is a big issue. I hear a lot of horror stories about EV insurance in particular going up. Now, the fact is, I have consulted with experts in the insurance industry, Tim Kelly from Motor Claim Guru, and though he says, yes, insurance is going up across the board, there are a great number of contributory factors for it. And as it stands, many EVs are more expensive than their combustion engine counterparts, so naturally, they are going to cost more to insure. However, we have both seen figures bandied about, oh, if you buy an EV, it will be 50% more money to insure it. Well, this is just not provable, as, as simple as that. Maybe it's true for some people, maybe it's not for other people, but there is no one simple figure that says EVs are X amount more to insure. Doesn't exist. Oh, and while we're on the topic, yes, I have also heard about this alleged whistleblower insurance video from Germany where somebody says that in the next 10 years, all cars are going to be digitized, and if your car isn't, you're not going to be able to drive it, and this is a way of forcing older cars off the road and, and all this sort of stuff. And honestly, full stop, I don't believe it. I just, I just don't believe it. Not that I don't believe some of the contents, but I don't believe the source. I haven't seen the original letter. I would like to see the original letter in the original language, but I'm not sure if that's available. And the person this was sent to, the letter in question seems to fit their ideals and their agenda, I would say, a little bit too neatly for me to find it particularly plausible. It is, however, a great story and a, a fantastic YouTube title, isn't it? They want you to stop driving your cars. In 10 years, old cars will be effectively banned. I mean, it's a, it's a great video, isn't it? And, um... I think that sort of stuff is dangerous because it will shift focus away from some more real and more pressing issues, which we are currently experiencing right now. I mean, how many people have heard stories or seen articles about EVs catching fire in car parks? And I assume at some point in the near future, somebody that owns or runs a car park firm might say, you know, you know how we were going to install these charging points 
actually, you know, I, I, I don't really want to take the risk. And then it's only a very small step from there for somebody to say, yeah, you, you know, actually, I, I, I don't know if we maybe want, want our EVs parking in this car park, or maybe we need to charge them more to deter them. It's, it's a slippery slope, and I, I hate that phrase with a passion because it is used by a, a lot of people for a lot of things, but ultimately that is potentially what we're looking at. You've also, I'm sure, heard all the stories that EVs after 10 years are effectively useless. They're paperweights, the batteries don't last. Well, again, we don't really have all the information on that topic. The technology is advancing so much that an EV today can't really be compared with one that's 10 years old because they are so different. And because of that, it's hard to work out whether these things will or won't be an issue. But if everybody believes that as soon as an electric car hits 10 years old, it's basically gone, well, guess what? At 10 years old, your EV will be worthless. Look at what happened to diesel, right? Diesel had a problem. Diesel got found out because everybody realized diesel wasn't as good as it claimed that it was. Big hoo-ha, headlines, news articles, apologies, mystery, intrigue, drama, all that sort of stuff. But we fixed the problem. We improved the diesels, we identified the issue, we've solved it, and diesel remains today a fuel that I think works for a lot of people. Yet, anybody and everybody I speak to, no matter who they are, how many miles they do, what they use their car for today, they don't want a diesel. Full stop. Diesel's reputation is shot to hell. It's never coming back. And though I don't really think this is actually going to happen for EVs, because they're a fundamentally different thing, I do think there's an element of it that's going to be coming. For quite some time, EVs seemed to be one of the few ordinary cars you could buy that were essentially depreciation proof. Tesla owners always very proud to tell you that it didn't really matter what was being charged for their car, because two years later it was still worth essentially the same. A lot of this has to do with the odd and unusual market conditions we've seen in the sort of COVID era. However, now the party is over. Much like the Porsche price video I did recently, well, EV prices are falling dramatically. And actually, in a lot of ways, I don't think this is really a sign of the EV market collapsing. Instead, what I think is simply happening here is what was always going to happen. Now that EVs are no longer an unusual, weird, niche thing that there are only a few manufacturers for and you can't really get the cars, they're everywhere, well, they're just going to depreciate like anything and everything else. I mean, look at dirty great big 4x4s that cost 100 grand. It was always the in-joke that basically you bought a Range Rover and a year later it was worth half a Range Rover. Simple as that. EVs now are just doing what regular combustion engine cars did forever. There's nothing really surprising about that to me. The only difference maybe is that because the purchase price of some of these cars is, you know, proportionately higher, that the actual numerical loss is also going to be quite a bit bigger, and in some cases, slightly terrifying. If we then see another step change in battery technology, you know, solid state is cracked and suddenly 600 miles becomes the new norm rather than 200 miles of range, well, um, I got a friend behind the camera who I know wants a Taycan, and as soon as they're 25 grand for a Taycan Turbo, he's going to be in there like a shot, and honestly, I can't blame him because if that works, great. I mean, the Audi e-tron, the, the original one, not the GT, that was a weird car. It was not a very good car ever, but they were like 95 grand. And now you can pick them up you know, like three years later for 25. That's terrifying. That's absolutely terrifying. And I think we're going to see quite a bit more of this. It is, of course, eventually going to stabilise. The market really is in quite a state of flux presently. So then, what to do? I hate to be the sort of person that makes a video like this and then just leaves you at the end with a bunch of whole new fears you never realised you even had, without leaving you with also a few suggestions. Me, I think the best thing that we can do in this scenario is be British about it. In other words, keep calm and carry on. Buy the car that suits your needs the best, be it petrol, diesel, hybrid or electric. Get the car that works for you. Don't get the car that people are pressuring you into buying. Buy the car that suits your needs, your budget. New, old, doesn't matter. And I know a lot goes into the car buying process, but certainly please do not feel pressured into buying an EV. We've now had a stay of execution here in Britain on account of the fact the government has 
logically, rare for them I know, moved our combustion engine cutoff date from 2030 back to 2035 in line with the rest of the EU. And to be honest, that was always a daft thing. I mean, Britain is just not a big enough market for people to have a solution just for it. It's caused a whole bunch of damage bringing the thing forward and probably a whole bunch of damage moving it back, but we were never going to meet 2030. It was just not going to happen. So anyway, we've got a long time. You know, 12 years is probably like, three cars at least for most people before this happens. And then, you know, combustion engines are not getting banned in 2035, just new sales. There are still going to be loads of old petrol diesel cars out there and they're going to be out there for quite some time still. There are plans on it to ban them wholesale, but those are far enough away that right now I'm just not going to worry about that. And of course, on the other hand, if you think that an EV is the best thing for your needs, well, buy one, do it, go for it, enjoy it, love your car. You know, it's, it's a car still, and I'm happy to see people buying them no matter what powers them. But uh, just don't think that you're going to be able to run it for free or that when you come to sell it, it's not going to have lost any money because from my perspective, neither of those things are true. And if you haven't had an EV at all before, maybe rent one or try and borrow one from someone and just see what it's like to live with because I think there are a lot of people just getting into it not really knowing how it works and then um, there's a bit of culture shock going on shall we say. From a governmental perspective though I think a lot more effort has to be put in. When you look at the amount of money spent on something like the failed HS2 rail network versus trying to electrify the roads of Britain you know put in charging points here there and everywhere it's a frankly frighteningly small amount a lot more effort must be put in and if we are really serious about trying to get the most polluting cars off the road then we need to see a proper countrywide scrappage scheme with enough behind it that it's actually going to encourage people to change and not necessarily change into an ev but just simply a newer car a lot of people on the lowest incomes, you know, the poorest families may be running a car that's 10 to 15 years old and there's a good chance that's going to be a diesel which is not ULES compliant. I would really like to see more effort done to get those people into something a little more modern that's not going to penalise them for having to go into a city centre or the like. I mean, in London as well, I mean, it's £12.50 charge or whatever for ULES, which to people with money that's that's an inconvenience right you're just going to pay it and just go oh, grumble 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 bloody city car oh, grumble 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 in scotland it's 60 quid the first day 120 quid the next day now that's that means they don't want those cars in there they're actually taking it seriously and actually in some ways i've got a lot more respect for that method going no 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 we don't want these cars in here full stop london though they have this whole half-hearted approach and I, I don't know just if you think about it 15 years ago we had the financial crisis and we had the scrappage scheme then and all that was really trying to do was to help car makers keep going. We're now being told that we're facing one of the greatest you know situations in our history. You know the future of the planet is at stake and yet for some reason we can't find money in the coffers to help people into lesser polluting cars. That, that I think is wrong. I would also like to see much much greater and stricter regulation of charging prices if a company can afford to give you charge at say 30 pence per kilowatt hour well they should give it to you at 30 pence per kilowatt hour you shouldn't need a member's card or whatever to to access that you know it shouldn't be 30 pence for someone that's got a tie can and 69 pence for someone that can only afford an, an mg3 or mg4 or whatever it's just wrong it's just flat out wrong and if as these companies are claiming 70p a kilowatt hour is what they have to charge just for it to be a viable business well we need to rethink this whole thing because economically it just isn't going to work, is it? It's just not doable. You can't push people into far more expensive cars that then cost a lot more to run. And don't tell me it's cheap to charge at home because not everybody has that luxury. We need to make sure this is an affordable, accessible solution for everybody. This shouldn't be a radical notion. As simple as that. I would also like to see more done to promote smaller, more affordable EVs. Currently, the trend is for all of them to be bigger and bigger and bigger because the battery packs are bigger and heavier, the motors are bigger and heavier, people want bigger cars, and this is damaging in a lot of ways. This increases congestion, it increases the stress and the strain on the road itself, you know, parking structures, all this sort of stuff. And I would like to see more done for smaller, more compact EVs. I think this really is quite important i think also maybe if these evs could have some sort of insurance incentive to get people into them you know there's a lot of things that i think could be done here to help that just aren't and i'd also like to see a slightly more inclusive future let's not 
cut humans out of it. You know, I mean, from a mental health perspective, there's something nice sometimes about being able to just, you know, hand someone some money and a, a please, a thank you, a, a smile and a, you know, you're doing all right today. It's, it's a small thing, I know. It's a silly thing, maybe, but it, it does mean a lot to people. I, I don't think we should cut humans out of the future entirely. I think we are still going to have our place no, no matter what happens next. And then if you wish to go and do some more research on this topic, or indeed have already been researching it, I would urge just one thing. We live in an incredible age where almost unlimited information is accessible to just about anybody. If you're watching this, you've got it. And so if you are watching videos, reading articles or whatnot, and it's from your preferred source, no matter what that may be, read one from another, take a different perspective in, because sometimes you'll see information that might challenge what you believe, and sometimes you'll draw your conclusion, no, you stick with your principles, but sometimes maybe you'll become a little more broad-minded and you'll go, mm, actually, I haven't considered this or this or this, and, and if you are watching a video that seems perhaps a touch sensationalist, shall we say, <clears throat> and uh, you think, maybe, maybe all of this is fitting this person's viewpoint just a, a little too neatly, just stop and think and do some research. It's pretty easy. It takes a, a few strokes of the keyboard and you can hopefully find out the information for yourself, preferably from a, a reputable source, because uh, take it from me, as somebody on social media, one of the problems with it is that there is little recourse for inaccurate information relayed to people. There is very little in the way of comebacks and many, many channels do not hold themselves to any kind of standard when it comes to correcting mistakes or honestly just telling the truth in the first place. And finally, last but not least, the most important thing is I have checked, I have accessed this great vast source of information that we have, and I can confirm Stacy's mum does still indeed have it going on. So on that note, I want to say thank you to all that have watched and a Merry Christmas, if that's your sort of thing. See you for the next one. Bye-bye.